today, you know, we have an excellent talk, you know, provided by our speaker. Uh, we'll show you how the, you know, the electronic industry may drive the automobile industry. So uh, the speaker comes from Terra. Uh, people in Bay Area must be familiar with this company. They create the FPGA, the fuel programmable rate. It's a highway that you can uh, change its behavior uh, in the field. Or uh, for some cases, if you're, the, the number of chip or device is not so high, it's not a million, 10 million device, it man, makes sense to even production with the FPGA. So it's widely used by people who create prototype you know, in many you know, uh, electric or IC design house. It's showing in many of these uh, uh, base stations. Uh, you see that uh, uh, using in the defense area uh, industry, you know, the, you know, the transportation uh, industry, the putting on the train, you know, the, you know some heavy duty uh, machine using that because you can uh, using the, the great power of a parallel processing of ASIC and this is uh, the function of FPGA that you can program and decide and uh, change it. Before I talk to Mike, actually uh, knowing that the FPGA is so suitable for the automotive uh, electronics, uh, he will talk more about that so that I don't need to speak for him. <laughs> So let's introduce you know, uh, today's speaker, uh, Michael Hendrick. Uh, he's an automotive product line manager at Atera. Uh, before joining Atera, he worked uh, for TI, a national semiconductor. And uh, he, you know, I talked with him, it's knowing he's a co work with many automobile maker and many interesting uh, experience you know, uh, he know, uh, story he know, he will uh, bring some of that and share with you. Let's welcome Mike. Uh, come to the stage. Hello, Ni Hao. Thank you for joining. Simon, thank you for the excellent uh, introduction. Michael Hendricks, I work for Altera, and I'm very excited to be speaking to you about automotive electronics and the trends that we foresee uh, in the future in this area. Today we'll talk about how automotive or how electronics will drive the automotive industry and how those trends will impact our lives in every day. So if we take a look back, Simon gave a good introduction on some of the history in automotive. Here's a little bit look back specifically around the electronics history in the automotive. Uh, in the late 1970s, electronics made up about 5% of the cost of an average car. Uh, just about 10 years ago, that was about 15%. And in modern hybrid cars today, it's about 45% of the cost. In the future, they think that standard vehicles will be at about 50% of the cost, and hybrids could be, electronics could represent about 80% of the cost. So you can see why it's such an exciting area to be playing in uh, for the semiconductor field today. If we look at the software side of it, microprocessors were first introduced by, uh, into cars by GM in 1977, originally for spark timing in 81, a few years later. A microprocessor was used to calculate the speed, the fuel, ignition information, and that ran on about 50,000 50, lines of code at the time. Anyone want to venture a guess today, if we look at a modern luxury car, uh, how many lines of code might be in a, in a, in a fancy car today? I heard, I heard a million and I heard a billion. So it's somewhere right in between those two answers. <laughs> So the modern, if we look at uh, like a Daimler S-Class today, there's about 100 million lines of code running on the Daimler S-Class today. And if you compare that to other things in the industry, if you look at the S-Class, 20 million lines of code just in the navigation system alone. So just in the nav system. If we compare that to an F-22 Raptor, which is a fighter jet, or uh, a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, if you take out the infotainment system from that, it's considerably more, it's a lot more complex. So if you look at the, the trend in these vehicles today, a modern uh, vehicle like the Daimler S-Class has about 100 ECUs in it, 100 electronic control units, each of those with the processing power of a high-end microprocessor or kind of a low-end laptop. So when we combine some sensors with those, it becomes a very exciting place for a mobile computing platform moving forward. 
So, some of you may say, I'm not in the automotive industry. Some of you may. I think all of us will be somehow familiar with the automotive industry moving forward. If we take a look at where, this, uh, where the technology is taking us in the future, it's really going to touch a lot of different corners of many industries. So, if you start off with, for example, the big data, big data and surveillance over here. In September of 2014, Obama administration passed uh, a legislation that mandates the input of a black box, similar to what they have in airplanes. They're now mandating that the black box is put inside the vehicle. That records about 20 seconds of data such that if a car is in an accident, they can go back and retrieve the information such as were the seat belts engaged? Uh, what, what was the position of the steering wheel? What was the position of the accelerator, of the brake? Uh, to do some recovery and history for, for those types of data. Uh, another, another example would be real estate. So with the advent of things like Google's driverless car, Uber, <coughs> ride sharing, uh, if you look at these in the self and the self-driving car, so if you have Uber and car sharing, you might not need all those parking spaces anymore because our average utilization for, for the vehicle is we drive it about maybe two hours a day, maybe five to 10% utilization. So most of the time it's sitting parked either in our driveways or in a parking lot, but if you have car sharing, they can utilize that resource continuously, maybe 90% of the time, you might not have the need for all those parking structures around and we can do something else with that real estate. Another trend is um, urbanization. Today everyone lives in the big cities because that's where the jobs are. Well, if you can bring a driverless car to work, you can start your day in the office as soon as you get in the car. Personally, I live in Santa Cruz and I can't wait to start my day when I get in the car instead of having to wait until I arrive in the office about an hour later. So it'll allow you to live further away as well. A couple different industries as well. Um, there's a uh, average worker spends 250 hours per year commuting. So all that time that you'd get back is about a month extra saving uh, of work time that you're able to apply to something else. Uh, and then wireless connectivity and the smartphone apps. The, the car of tomorrow is being called the next mobile computing platform. Um, Jensen, the CEO of NVIDIA, spent an hour and a half at CES talking about automotive, automotive, automotive. It's the next exciting big compute platform. Uh, so if you look at all the apps that are being developed for the smartphones today, a lot of the connectivity and all the sensors that are going into the vehicle, it's a very exciting um, and powerful computing network that uh, we're all going to be enjoying in the very near future. So from an electronics or a semiconductor's perspective, how come I'm so excited about working in this space? If you look at the thin blue line on the graphic here, that thin blue line represents the, the uh, light vehicle production, which is uh, the number of cars that are produced each year. So we, this year, or last year, we did about 84 million units globally of light vehicles and trucks, and it should reach about 100 million in 2018. And that growth rate is going at a clip of about 3.5% if you look at it back from 1997 to the, to the present or future date up into 2020. So, okay, 3.5% CAGR, I'm not super excited about that. If you look at automotive semiconductors in that same time frame, it's growing at about double that rate at 7%. Well, it starts to get exciting. The company in the area that I work for in programmable logic is growing at even double that. So you can see why I'm uh, quite excited about the, the opportunity that lies ahead for programmable logic in automotive. If we compare automotive ICs, integrated circuits, uh, the market growth rate to other segments across a different time frame, this time from 13 to 18, uh, automotive is a, is a very healthy sector to be in, growing at uh, maybe about double the rate of many of the other uh, markets that we could compare it to. So what's driving all this growth in the automotive space? Really, I boil it down to three different things. The first one is consumer demand. And the electronics are really what are selling the cars today. If you look at the commercials, what are selling the cars on TV, it's all about the, the electronics and the systems and services inside. You can see here, this is Audi's, uh, what they call a free programmable cluster, which instead of the analog dials and gauges that we're used to, they're now going to digital reconfigurable displays. You can customize it. And an interesting quote from Audi here saying that, Electronics enabled features are responsible for about $10,000 increase in the average transaction prices for the cars sold in the United States over the past five years. So electronics are the reason uh, that they're able to boost up their ASPs. And another interesting quote from Audi is they think that their cars are the grandest and most beautiful electronic devices on the planet. That's a pretty strong claim, but they do have some pretty, they do have some pretty exciting technology coming up.
the other thing is saving lives. So if you look at safety, uh, every year, 1.2 million fatalities uh, on the roads uh, across, the, across the globe. 90% of those are caused by human error. And with the advent of the technology taking over, if you just look at, at intoxicated driving alone, that represents about 39% of the fatalities on the road. So if you just took that out, you could save 40% of the lives. And electronics uh, uh, and the technology has a great opportunity to do so. And then the last one here is the efficiency in the environment. Uh, you can see the legislation that's been passed is the the mandate uh, is increasing significantly for the average uh, miles per gallon uh, to the vehicle or the, the efficiency. So that's driving adoption of different types of cars. So you see electric car coming on the road, the hybrid electrics. Hybrid electric vehicles have about 10 times more semiconductor content in them than an, a traditional internal combustion engine. So good opportunity in hybrids and EVs. Let's take a look at China. This has been uh, largely becoming a very important market for automotive. If we take a step back 20 years ago, so if you look on the chart here, 20 years ago, China was only consuming about a million vehicles per year. If you compare that to the rest, it was kind of a, a don't care market for the OEMs. So 20 years ago. If you fast forward to present day, it's now the number one market and the hottest market, most important market for all of the OEMs globally. Look at the growth that, that we went from relatively 1 to 8 to 25 in present year. So that's causing a lot of trends that are kicking off in the industry. 10 years ago, only one Chinese OEM, Shanghai Automotive, made the Fortune 500. Now there's six on that list. And also, with the local demand as a strong base, uh, a lot of those Chinese auto automotive makers are likely to soon consolidate and better serve their, their domestic market. So we're going to be seeing the Chinese OEMs gaining a lot of share and becoming a dominant player in the future. Shanghai is a very important hub in automotive uh, on the global scale. It's uh, uh, gaining a lot of uh, momentum. So I'm going to talk about three different megatrends in my talk today. Uh, the first one around kind of uh, what we call e-cockpit, electronic cockpit, and a few trends happening in there. Telematics, uh, the cluster, head-up display, HMI are a few of the things that are driving kind of the infotainment uh, and connectivity environment. Next, uh, the driverless car and EV powertrain. But first, let's talk about uh, the e-cockpit and what's going on in infotainment and connectivity. If you take a look at the Tesla Model S, IHS, who's a market research company, they, uh, they bought a wrecked Model S. So a Tesla Model S had gotten into an accident and crashed. Tesla, or IHS, purchased that one and did a teardown of the components inside. And just looking at the uh, at the head unit itself in the, in the infotainment system, here are some of the, the top 10 most valuable components in there. But the head unit alone has about 5,300 individual components in it. And we think our, our smartphones are quite complex today. So my iPhone 5 has about uh, 1,200 individual components in it. Pretty complex device. The Tesla head unit's got about 4x that. Uh, and Unfortunately, uh, we're, we're designed into uh, uh, the information display, the cluster, and then we also have some sockets uh, in the powertrain as well. But you can look down the list of the different suppliers here. So there's some interesting semiconductor content, and then as well as the display manufacturers. Uh, so you've got Freescale, NVIDIA, uh, ST Micro, and Texas Instruments, and my company, Altera, is lucky to be on the list uh, in Tesla as well. They've been a great not only a great customer for us, but also a different model. They're acting as both the supplier and the OEM. Many of the other OEMs uh, rely on their supplier base, such as Bosch, Continental, Denso would be some examples of those tier one suppliers. Tesla's doing both of those things on their own. They're, the, they're, they're their own supplier and their own manufacturing house for the OEM. <clears throat> Telematics is another hot trend happening in this space. So if you can imagine all of those electronic control units, all of that code, all of those sensors in the vehicle, and now you put a big, fat, wireless data pipe on top of that. It's a very powerful computing platform. So the trend that's happening in telematics, uh, both with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure uh, type of connectivity, is you're getting the merging of these different sensor data from other vehicles, from the cloud, uh, from other infrastructure sources, and being able to predict road conditions, traffic conditions ahead. So for example, 
in this image, uh, if you're coming down the highway or an on-ramp and there's a, perhaps there's been an accident up ahead, the message can be communicated from car to car to car to car, or it can be communicated up to the cloud and back to the car to let the, either the driver know or the car know, hey, there's an accident ahead, you might want to take another route or slow down or prepare for what might be ahead. Some of the challenges facing the adoption here is the security of the link. So that one's very, very hot. Uh, DSRC is one of the technologies that's being proposed uh, for that. Also the adoption, if you just put a thousand cars with this telematics capability on the road, it doesn't really help. You need a widely deployed network of a lot of vehicles on the road. So it needs government mandates and legislation to make it really take off and happen. And then lastly, the infrastructure. The infrastructure on the back end needs to have a viable business case to support that. Cockpit evolution. So the cockpit evolution could be going through many different trends. The way that I decided to take it for today's presentation is to really look inside on what is happening inside that cockpit. As we know it, traditional car, you sit in front of the steering wheel and you have your brake and your accelerator. And if you take a look forward in the driverless car, that whole infrastructure can change now within the vehicle. So Daimler had made a presentation uh, at CES just last month uh, in January about their vision of the driverless car of the future. As you can see here, the, the seating is reconfigurable inside, so it feels more like maybe a living room or a home office where you can do your work while the car drives for you. And then also graphical displays and different opportunities for, for things within that cockpit as well. Uh, on the lower right is Harman's concept of uh, kind of an office in the vehicle uh, as the car is driving you to work. And then Google's driverless car, pretty cute little car up there. That car has no steering wheel, has no uh, brake pedal, and no accelerator. All it has is a display on the dashboard or a connection to your smartphone. So you get in and you tell it where you want it to take you. <clears throat> You'll notice on the top of the Google driverless car is a, a Velodyne reticulating laser scanner that spins at 360 degrees uh, around. I'll get in a little bit more on that technology compared to others in the next chapter. Okay, next one up is, uh, is ADOS, which stands for Automated uh, Driver Assistance Systems, which uh, is the technology that's going into the driverless cars. And under this lens, we're going to look at the three different sensor types that are really enabling this technology to take off, which is the camera, the radar, and the laser scanner. <clears throat> Primary ADOS sensors, as I noted before, radar, uh, camera, and LIDAR, and their representative units in the year 2020, which each one of them will be shipping. So by far, cameras are the most dominant, and the reason why is an image sensor is a relatively low cost item, and you can get a, install a camera uh, into a vehicle for relatively low cost. And then if you also look at the differences between these, not one sensor on its own, is going to do the job. So there needs to be a combination of all these different sensors. They all have their own strength and they all have their own weakness. For cameras, they can do the visual image. So if you want to detect whether something is a pedestrian, an animal, a cyclist, or if you want to read the information on a traffic sign, 55 miles per hour, you need vision. You need a camera to do that. But if you're driving at night, in the fog, in the snow, where the visibility isn't very good, you're going to need another technology such as a radar or a lidar that can see through that uh, that depth and distance so all of those things are combining together and going around the vehicle the image below shows a bit about where each one of those go so the camera really looks uh, surround view it looks in the back for the park assist and as well for forward detection and the, the radar and the laser are meant to go far far in advance in the front end and then kind of the mid-range and short range in the back and the sides Additionally, in addition to those, there's ultrasound, which is primarily used for the, the near field for things like parking assist. Now I've got a fun video to share. This one's from uh, courtesy of Audi and their partner TT Tech, who helped to develop uh, some of the technology that's going into in Audi's piloted drive. Audi was the first manufacturer to test piloted driving in the desert. Far away from civilization, an Audi TTS drove over the Bonneville Salt Flats and reached a world speed record for piloted driving of 130 miles per hour. Driving autonomously, the TTS mastered the legendary Pikes Peak Hill Climb in 2010. The Audi completed the 12-mile climb with 156 bends in around 27 minutes. The top speed was about 45 miles per hour. 
Using GPS, the Audi was able to determine its position down to two centimeters. In 2013, Audi became the first car manufacturer in the world to receive a license from the Nevada Department of Motor Vehicles to test autonomous vehicles. Audi presented its vision of piloted driving, demonstrating it in traffic congestion and when parking. In the future, thanks to piloted driving from Audi, the car can easily be maneuvered into the garage or a tight parking space from the outside using the remote control key or a smartphone. Now it's time for series production. When in 2013 Audi was still at the preliminary development stage, the computing equipment needed filled the car's entire luggage compartment. Now this technology is as small as a laptop and goes by the name of ZFAS. All functions, one unit. The processors on the ZFAS board achieve a total computing output equivalent to the complete electronic architecture of a current Audi A4. All functions are controlled by ZFAS to make piloted driving possible. Up to 12 ultrasonic sensors scan the close environment of the vehicle. The front radar detects objects up to a distance of 250 meters ahead of the car. The rear radar sensors monitor the traffic behind. The top view cameras work together with the ultrasonic sensors, for example, where the car parks piloted. For the first time, a laser scanner delivers highly accurate data up to a distance of 80 meters. The front camera with a wide angle recognizes the lane markings as well as pedestrians and objects. By combining these sensors, the ZFAS enables the piloted driving. The vehicle always knows exactly what is happening around it. Piloted driving. The future is now. Audi is continuing to extend its lead and is already using series production technology. Pretty fun video. Uh, pretty exciting technology that's going on in there. So the leap that Audi has taken, uh, I'll get into the architecture uh, in a little bit, but before I do, uh, just touching on, uh, on that board, it's a pretty huge uh, jump to go from a boot full of CPUs, uh, personal computers, and soft running a software and implement that in hardware in such a small area in PCB, but a lot of very powerful sil sil semiconductor content on that board. Uh, Altera Cyclone 5 SOC, we did a press release uh, last month at, uh, at CES, so we're able to talk about this now. Altera Cyclone 5 SOC is doing uh, the sensor fusion, the combining of the, the radar and the vision data. We're also doing the uh, time-triggered Ethernet uh, switch uh, within from IP from TT Tech uh, for TSN network, uh, com communicating to all the different uh, ICs on the board, and then also some uh, LIN bus processing for the ultratonic sensors. In addition, Audi's been very vocal about their partnership with NVIDIA. Um, so the NVIDIA uh, K1 is also on the board doing a host of different functions. And there's some other devices on there doing uh, order for the different vision algorithms and then also for functional safety. So just a quick note on why Altera was chosen for that particular application, the high-speed communication to the GPU, the ECC on memory for improved functional safety, a very high logic density, the high throughput for parallel processing, and then collaboration with our, our partner base. Here's what's different about Audi's approach than the rest of the industry. <clears throat> so traditionally in automotive, if you hear a new feature, new feature means new box. Effectively, if you're gonna add something like surround view to your car, that means a new ECU, a new module that needs to go into the car until it's vetted out over the course of maybe two, three, four years, and then it can be integrated into something else. So in ADOS, what that looks like is a distributed architecture. There's lots of different boxes, individual modules and ECUs doing uh, specific functions. What Audi has done, instead of kind of doing this model or even going to the next step, they've done a bit of a quantum leap over to a fully centralized architecture. And they're doing as much as they can on that ZFOS board. All, all functions, uh, one unit on ZFOS. So that's what we call a centralized architecture. And really, it took someone like Audi or an OEM to do that because the tier ones, when they look at it, they're usually concentrating on specific components. It really needed the leadership of one of the OEMs to push forward on that. So Audi's uh, taking, taking a lead in the centralized architecture space. 
and then just comparing a couple different semiconductor um, suppliers on where they where they play. So things like ASSP and GPU are very well suited for kind of the mid range and the, and the high end. Um, and then the MCUs and other type of ASSPs might be more optimized for specific functions. Uh, the FPGA is the only platform that really can scale across those different architectures all the way from the distributed up to the centralized architecture. And for a supplier uh, like the OEM, they like that because then they can take an architecture and scale it from their entry model vehicles all the way up to their luxury model vehicles. Uh, let's look at a couple different approaches to self-driving. So on the left hand side you've got the automakers approach and real what, really what they're doing, it's a real time uh, view of the world with all of that different real time sensor data coming in, the, the camera, the laser scanner, the, set, uh, the radar, all of that they're ingesting real time and it's not, not right now it's not connected or tethered to, uh, to the cloud and it's not reliant on that. If you look at the other side, Google is taking a very different approach. So if you look at Google's strengths, their strengths are in Google Maps, their strengths are in um, that very high precision mapping and precision location. So they're taking kind of a, a pre-mapped world and looking at the deltas between those. So with Google's 360 degree articulating Velodyne laser scanner, they're looking in real time at what are those changes and what are those individual components difference for what they've mapped in, a, in previously. The one drawback to that is uh, the high precision LiDAR is quite expensive. That unit alone is about $70,000, so it's not a very practical goal for commercialization aspect. Uh, but I think they're on, on a road, they've got something up their sleeve for, for productization at a later time. So a couple of different approaches on how to do the driverless car and different business models with that as well. So if we look at the business models on the auto manufacturer strategy, really what the auto OEMs want to do, they want to sell cars, right? So they want you to drive the car, and when you want to put it in self-driving mode, you can switch it on to a piloted mode and have the car drive itself for you. Uh, Google strategy, they don't care about selling cars because they're not making cars. What they want to get, they just want to get you inside the vehicle and then they can advertise or, or do something else. So <laughs> that's their revenue model, right? So they just want to get you in and, uh, and out. So they're approaching it from kind of a different, uh, a different perspective. So Google's going about it from kind of an autonomous mobility, like a robo-taxi or the Uber type of a model. And then Audi is going about it like, have fun in your car. When you want to drive, drive it yourself. And when you don't want to drive, the car can drive for you. Um, so that's a, a pretty interesting dichotomy. And then if you look at the, the driverless cars and the, the things around it, the different opportunities that that's going to open up for us, all of those sensor opportunities, the big data, that black box going in, the insurance companies, the government regulations, uh, all the compute algorithms for the semiconductor companies, the artificial intelligence, the robotics. There's lots of different trends in many different aspects that this advent is going to, uh, going to kick off for us. So if we look at a couple of different major disruptions in transportation, as Simon introduced, you know, one of the first cars uh, in the world was the, the Daimler in the early, late 1800s, even before that, the tricycle steam engine. If we look back at the major disruptions in transportation, back in maybe 1900, the big change was you were getting rid of a horse on the carriage, right, and going to a motorized vehicle. So the, the, the value proposition at that time is written here, save the expense, care, and anxiety of keeping it. To run a motor carriage costs about half cent per mile. So don't worry about keeping your horse, you have to feed it, you have to take care of it, it's a living being. The motor carriage just sits in the garage. You don't need to worry about it until you drive it. So that was a big innovation maybe uh, back in the 1900s. Today, we're looking at dispensing with the driver and the big trend that that's going to, that's going to take. So this is another conceptual, uh, pretty exciting concept on what it might look like inside the vehicle where you've got the steering wheel that slides over to the middle to get out of your way and you're in a kind of a luxury mode on the, on the way to the office or on the way to uh, dinner or vacation. <clears throat> okay, last chapter that I'll talk about is uh, electric vehicle and powertrain uh, in a few different areas here, motor control, battery management system, and also uh, engine control unit. So if we take a look at the electric vehicles, what are the pros and cons of owning an electric vehicle? So the benefits shown there on the left is really the, there's a lower operating cost. There's no need for gasoline. You don't have to go to the gas station anymore. Gas stations are a thing of the past. The average American spends about two to $4,000 a year just on gas alone. 
There's also less maintenance. There's no engine inside per se, no mechanical engine, so you don't have to do oil changes. There's no mechanical engine to lubricate. There's no transmission, so there's no fluid changes. And the brakes don't wear as quickly because you've got regenerative braking on the electric vehicle that when the car is slowing, it regenerates the motor uh, so the brake pads wear uh, less frequently. Also, some government incentives, uh, such as, for example, the, the Nissan LEAF starts at around 30K with government incentives can be as low as 20K. Some of the downsides listed there, limited range, 75 to 100 miles. Tesla Model S goes about 200, so you can't quite drive all the way to LA yet, but they're getting there. Uh, long recharge time, but if you don't mind parking it in the office or at home, it's not such a big deal. Lack of infrastructure in the charging stations, but those are getting rolled out as well. Battery is expensive to replace, but there's a pretty exciting uh, trend that's coming up on that one as well. 120 electric scooters sold in China alone uh, per year. And uh, by 2020, uh, batteries will deliver about 2x the energy density for about half the present cost. So there's some exciting trends ahead. One of the things that uh, Bosch and, and BMW and a few other partners are looking at is what do you do with the batteries in the EV once they're done? So they take the retired battery out of the electric vehicle and you can either put it into your home as an energy storage unit or you can put it into an infrastructure. PG&E and BMW just recently collaborated on a project to take a bunch of old batteries out of the Mini, put them into BMW Mountain View, and then that will help PG&E during times of uh, energy uh, demand spike, then they can pull off of that battery cell in Mountain View and be able to uh, help the demand spike. Um, so this is a, a great example of how we're recycling the use for Second Life batteries. Uh, this is just a uh, an couple block diagram on where the semiconductor opportunities are within the electric vehicle. Uh, the powertrain MCU market, so as I mentioned earlier, 10x the uh, semiconductor content in a hybrid versus an internal combustion, and then some of the trends on what's driving them. So if you look at the CAGR for the engine type, internal combustion engines are actually forecast to be shrinking at about a negative percent compound annual growth rate, while you have very strong growth in the other hybrid and electric vehicle. The MCUs that are going into those hybrids and electrics, especially the more complex ones, such as the 30-bit, 32-bit multi-core, uh, have very explosive growth rates going up uh, into the order of about greater than 200% uh, compound AO growth rate. Okay, a couple more slides and we'll wrap up. So you're excited about automotive, so are a lot of people, and there's a big influx to Silicon Valley. Look at the trend that's happened from the OEMs coming into the valley over the past 15 years. Went from 2 to 15. Uh, many OEMs and Tier 1s are flocking to the valley for three primary reasons. The first reason is all the electronic content that's going into the vehicle. Uh, the second reason is the design cycles. BMW used to refresh their head unit maybe every five years. Now they're doing that every two years because they have to keep pace with consumer expectations on nice rich displays on what we see on our smartphones and tablets. Uh, and then the, the third one is the complexity of design that's going into those. There's so much technology going into it, the OEMs cannot be experts in everything. So they're relying on startups, on partners, on software vendors, semiconductor companies to help them innovate and keep the pace of this moving forward. So if you liked what you saw today and you want to get more involved in Silicon Valley, there's a, a great chapter. Uh, my company is part of this, as are many others. Um, there is a subscription fee, uh, but if you pay the subscription fee for your company, you get all access. Anyone from the company is welcome to join. It's called the Auto Tech Council. They have monthly meetings in Silicon Valley to provide regular opportunity for networking. They usually have demonstrations available. And then startup companies that are involved in the automotive area come and pitch to the VCs and to the audience there to kind of vet their ideas. Uh, we've been part of it for a little over a year, and I can say it's one of the better memberships that we have, so I could highly recommend it to anyone who's, uh, who's interested. The calendar of events that are coming up, the next one coming up uh, uh, is on Sensors uh, next Friday, hosted by NVIDIA. If you're not a member, it's also open to a public. Uh, there's just a, a fee at the door for non-members. So thank you very much for your time and interest today, Shay Shay, and I look forward to speaking to you later. Now we'll open for questions. Please line up uh, after uh, the microphone. So let me ask the first one. Uh, a few years ago, Google 
you know, have this uh, first uh, driverless car. And uh, uh, someone estimated the cost of those uh, driverless car. Uh, he said that about uh, 150K for the, I think, I don't know if it's including the, the car party or is it only the electronics? Uh, how about the, the current technology, right? So the several years past, what we can achieve right now? Good question. Thanks, Simon. So uh, as Simon noted, Google's technology right now is quite expensive, $70,000 just for the, the LiDAR itself. Uh, if we look at the current technology, um, one good example is Subaru has a, what they call EyeSight. Subaru EyeSight is a, it's a stereo vision camera that goes inside the windscreen of the vehicle and that one's selling in Japan now with about a 90% fit rate. And what that means is for 90% of the cars that are sold in Japan, they come with that option equipped and they only charge about $1,000 to $2,000 for that system. And what that system does is it provides automatic emergency braking. So if you're going to get into an accident, if it's imminent, then the car will apply the brakes for you. So it either uh, eliminates the, the impact or greatly reduces the, the effect of it. To answer the full question, moving forward, if we forecast into the future, how much is the driverless car technology going to cost us as consumers? Uh, I've read some research that points to could be as low as five to $10,000 way out in the future. Uh, right now it's being offered as a luxury option, uh, so it'll probably be a bit higher than that to, to start out. Good question, thanks. Anyone want to ask questions? Yes, please use the microphone. Your, uh, your company, uh, your name and question. Oh, I'm a retired person, no company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a jet fighter cost 50 million to 100 million dollars. A car costs only 20,000 20, to uh, 90,000 dollars. But you said there are more software code lines in the car than in a jet fighter. What's the uh, philosophy behind? Is it reasonable to have this comparison? Good question. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the comparisons is once you get uh, an airplane up into the sky, there's much less things to deal with in space. It's wide open space, there's blue sky around, so there's not a whole lot of things to deal with once you're, you're up. So the most challenging thing for aircraft is really the takeoff and the landing. Um, for fighter jets themselves, they do have a lot of different compute algorithms in there, but if you look at the problem of for example, the driverless car and being on the road, uh, every millisecond of time you're having to deal with not only land and all the things that it offers with the, the trees, the road, the potholes, the conditions on the road, the, the weather there, but also all the other things that are around, uh, around it as well, all the other moving cars, the vehicles, the pedestrians, the traffic signs. So a lot of that, a lot of that compute algorithm as well as the, the infotainment system and what's going into that is where all that software code comes from. Good question. So, the next one. Uh, my name is Simon Wang. I represent the company Unigen. Um, the speaker mentioned the, there's so many components, eight, up to 80% component in the, in the future. Uh, there's, there's so many uh, data on the sensor side, controller side. How do you store this kind of data? Uh, only I'm talking about the uh, PGA, FPGA. How do you save the data? To, actually real time to, to process. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned how many data you're going to save in your car or in the car. Thank you. Uh, good question. So question there is with all of that information coming in to the vehicle, all this ingest of different data through the different sensor networks, and the storage of that, uh, how much are you storing, where are you storing it, what's the memory architecture look like, and what's the, what's the processing access to that memory architecture? Right now, the way that the industry is going is not to save a lot of the data. The black box that's going into the vehicle is only saving about 20 seconds of the last 20 seconds. Uh, but the others, they're just accessing it and ingesting it and processing in real time. So they need uh, real access to the instant memory, but they're not storing a whole lot of the data beyond uh, what's already been executed. Michael, do you have a question? Yes, Michael Shea, UC Berkeley Extension. The question is, uh, now a car looks like a, a prime target for hacking. So has there been any incident being published or publicized? Uh, I'm sure there have been some. I'm sure there have been some attempts. I am not familiar with any incident that has been publicized yet. I think the big challenge for 
uh, today, not many of those cars are networked. They're not tied to the to the cloud. So I think that's one of the big challenges for the adoption of telematics the, and V to X and V to V in the future, and one of the big challenges to uh, to overcome, I think, uh, for the future adoption of that technology. Because one concern about a car is it is a weapon. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, absolutely. If you could get control of that vehicle, then it could be it could be quite dangerous, and that's. There's an interesting trend. Uh, Elon Musk, from CEO from Tesla, has come on record to say that the, the technology for driverless car will be available in 2016 or 2017. So the ability to make a driverless car and drive it on the roads will be there. But mass adoption is not going to happen until about 2025 due to the legislation hurdles on, and the security and all these other problems that they have to overcome before putting those out on the road. Joe Liu from the, uh, Shen Electric. Um, you mentioned that uh, a battery, car battery, can be reused uh, in industry facility, and uh, I know that in industry facility, the battery also has a lifespan. And uh, uh, I'm wondering, can you elaborate more about uh, how the uh, use the battery from the car can be reused uh, in an industry facility? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So there's two primary use cases for once an electric vehicle is expired in your car, maybe it's got lower uh, capacity and storage rate, maybe something on the order of 70% or less of what its original uh, uh, storage was. There's a couple different models. One of them is to do an energy storage unit in the home uh, so that, for example, if you had a solar array at the home, you could charge that cell unit at your home and then use that for energy storage or energy um, within the home during peak times when it's more expensive or potentially even when the power's out, you can use the energy for that. And you can also leverage that for charging your, in a DC current, for charging your electric vehicle instead of connecting through the charger which is hooked up to the grid. That's the home model. There's also the industry model, which I think your question was more directed at. And there's a couple things, the BMW and PG&E model is two interesting ways that they're doing it. One was the first that I had mentioned on putting a bunch of, of old batteries and having that as an energy storage unit to help offset uh, the demand when it spikes. They can help offset that and draw from that as an energy source. The other one is when you have all the electric vehicles that are connected to the grid, they're doing a pilot program um, called, uh, I think it's First Charge uh, with BMW for the, for the mini owners. And during peak demands, they're asking those vehicles, they'll send a, a message to the vehicle and actually stop charging those 100 vehicles for the, until the demand of the energy company goes down. So it all helps to balance the uh, kind of the peaks and valleys of the, of the energy companies. Thanks, uh, Mike's uh, talk again. Thank you very much. So I'd like to present NCIE to present this uh, small token. To oh, you. thank, thank you, you very much.